to actually was, uh, I think it was the first craft beer, you know, craft beer in a can that I ever had. Um, at this point, probably, uh, when it first came out eight or nine years ago. Um, and it, it, it at that time I was a 16 ounce can for, for the diehard old time six point fans out there. Um, and I remember drinking it and thinking like, how, like, how would I describe this beer and like what I'm getting and all I could think of was it's crisp. And, and that was it. And I was kind of stuck there. I kept on like trying to think of new adjectives. Um, but yeah, this beer is pushing a decade at this point. Um, and, uh, it's, it's largely stayed the same as we'll get into with German malts, German hops. Uh, and it's pretty awesome that we're still making as much, if not more of it today and, uh, we get to have it right now. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know what you guys at home are doing. I've got two glasses here so I can drink both of these beers side by side. If you're only going to start with one uh, and you have both of these beers, or if you have a Hellas and a Pilsner, I would recommend starting with the Hellas. And then after you're done with the Hellas, we can move on to the Pilsner. We're going to talk about them side by side. So if you do have two glasses, or if you want to run and grab a second glass real quick, um, you might be able to identify with what we're talking about a little bit better if you can switch from smelling or tasting the Hellas to the Pilsner and back and forth. Uh, because these are styles that are pretty similar, but once we dive into them, you'll see they have some real distinct differences as well. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I got, I have two glasses here as well. Two of the, two of the same, two steins. Um, these are from a small brewery in a small town in Germany. Um, fortunately, don't have any, any of the six point steins with me, but uh, these will suffice for now. That's awesome. And as we'll get into in a little bit, uh, Adam has been to Germany. Have you been to Germany more than once, Adam? Uh, yeah, a few times. Um, but also, uh, Adam was there in Germany last year for hop harvest for Six Point. It was. So we'll see some pictures of that too. Oh, so yeah. this is the Alpen Flow. New, new can design. Um, Fancy, fresh, showing off the mountains. Yeah, another Jack Liak is special. I, uh, I have to open two of each beer because since this is a proper half liter, it's one twelve ounce can doesn't fill it up. I should have thought ahead of that and uh, and brought extra cans, but instead my uh, mug is going to be a little bit light. That's okay. I forgive you. All right. Now that is a pour that I can be happy with on that Pilsner. If you're paying attention at home, you'll see that I'm drinking the Pilsner out of a very traditional German style footed Pilsner glass. And I've got my Hellas in a dimpled mug over here, which is a little bit more typical for something like a Czech Pilsner, but pretty close to the sort of stein that you would see in Munich area as well for Hellas. So, so both pretty typical glassware on those. Um, let's just, just jump in a little bit to the history. And so I want to start by talking about the origins of Pilsner because that one's a little bit older. Can't just look at this glass though and not take a sip of it, right? So cheers guys. Cheers at home. Cheers. That is delicious. It really is. <laughs> Pilsner is a little bit older than Hellas. Uh, and the original Pilsner was invented in 1842 in, at the time, what was Bohemia, then became Czechoslovakia, and now Czech Republic. Uh, so 1842, credited to a brewer named Joseph Grohl in Pilsen, which is where the name Pilsner comes from. If you are in the Czech Republic, they only call one beer Pilsner, and that's Pilsner Urkel, because it's the original Pilsner. Everything else just gets called a Czech premium pale lager. Um, and those styles moved towards Germany about the 1870s, you start to see German interpretations of a Pilsner style, but it wasn't until 1894 that Spaten released the first Hellas beer, uh, and that was the Spaten Hellas Lager beer. So almost a, or a little bit over a 50 year difference actually between the first Pilsner and the first Hellas Lager. Um, if you're looking at them, they look pretty darn similar. Obviously it's not super easy to compare. It might be easier with your glassware, yeah. Pretty close on the color though both golden, both nice and light. When you have these two beers side by side, the biggest difference is gonna be in the hop balance. 
because they're both very, uh, they're both malt forward beers and they're both done with a Pilsner malt or a very pale malt. So the malt character is gonna be similar. Uh, the difference lies in the balance. The, something like the Crisp, a Pilsner, much, much more hop aggressive. Whereas the, uh, the Alpen Flow, the Hellas, much more subtle on the hops, uh, still a little bit of a floral hop character, but we'll, we'll get into that. What are you thinking, Adam? No, I, I, I agree. I um, uh, Yeah, I think the way that the, the BJCP in particular kind of dives into the history and describes these beers, it's it's very interesting the way they choose their their words, um, uh, which I, I, I took a line uh, from there, which I'll get back to later. But yeah, I mean, it's, it is kind of kind of incredible to think um just how recent these beers are in their history right and in between them as you're saying 1894 is the hellas uh and the the czech pills um uh, in the 1840s and i think the german pills which is what the crisp is was like the 1870s yep exactly but in the scheme of beer you know not just centuries but you know pushing over a thousand years I mean, it's really recent, um, you know, and we all kind of think of lagers as old, but they're really not. And I actually remember getting reprimanded uh, very early in my brewing days for mixing that up, thinking that lagers were, were somehow older. Um, so it, it, it is pretty incredible um, to just think of that context of just how young these styles are. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And it's, uh, it's worth noting because these days, Pilsner derived beers are easily the most popular beers worldwide. Yep. You know, if you talk about whether it's something like an American adjunct lager or a Pilsner or a Dortmunder or a Munich Helles, uh, these are all styles that were inspired by the original Czech Pils and they make up the vast majority of all beer consumed. But like you said, it's really only a style that's been around for 160, 180 years, I guess at this point. Uh, it, when I do math in my head, it's still the year 2000. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're past that um but at the same time big differences here uh you know they both have a lot of history behind them they both have a lot of myths behind them the pilsner in particular you, i feel like i'm sure you've heard this story adam if, you, if you've read one book you've probably seen it uh there's this myth of a monk that smuggled some yeast into bohemia and delivered it to the pilsner brewery uh, there, there's no truth to that. You, you still see it written down in books, but anyone who's done some actual research before they write their book will <laughs> stand up for the fact that there are receipts that show that uh, Urkel paid for the yeast that they used for the original batch. It was an intentional thing to brew this light beer. And it's also worth noting that the Czech Pilsner really was the first style of beer that was widespread that looked like this, something that you could see through. That wasn't necessarily a reflection on malting technology. Malting technology, you, you could make pale malt before 1842, uh, but what had recently been invented was glassware like this. Having a beer that's pretty to look at and crystal clear and pale golden becomes much more appealing when you have crystal clear glassware. Whereas even in the early 1800s, mostly uh, what they were drinking out of was stoneware mugs and stoneware steins. So if you can't see the beer in your glass or the liquid in your glass, no matter what it is, the color and the clarity don't matter at all. Uh, so I, I always think that's pretty interesting too. Like clear glassware came before clear beer. Yeah. All of a sudden it was less appealing to drink something that looked like, uh, you know, just slop or gruel or something like that. What, whatever it would look like. <laughs> basically threw a loaf of bread into water and let it sit there for a week. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even, even the Stein the glass steins are a very modern thing. They're purely just a recreation of ceramic or stone steins. Um, but glassware is just kind of the standard today, but it's de designed to be just a glass version of that. Um, and also I think as far as uh, what you're talking about with the yeast and, and just kind of how these, how the Pilsner style is so popular today or Pilsner derived styles in particular, um, if we, model what happened in the late 19th century with uh, very much the beer industry today with trends um that was happening right and and you can correct me if i'm wrong here but spaten made the first munich hellas to compete with pilsner beers because they were becoming so popular Absolutely. Um, it would be like somebody coming out with uh yet another ipa to compete with hazy ipas 
Um, so even though, you know, we think of the popularity still growing, you know, over the last hundred years, 50 years, especially when you think of mass produced uh, macro loggers in cans, uh, in, the, in the late 19th century, it was still that same sense of like other brewers saying, oh crap, what are the other brewers doing? They're, you know, they're making this really light lager based beer. You know, we should, we should try something out to try to compete with that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I see two questions in the chat here that while we're talking about history, we'll get to very briefly. Uh, McKenna asked, what is the oldest style of beer? And that's a great question. I don't think we are uh, drinking any styles today that necessarily have their roots back a thousand years. Um, you know, and, and style guidelines on the whole are a pretty recent invention. If even in some countries, if you go to Belgium, the brewers almost wholly reject the idea of style guidelines and they just brew beers designed to taste good. Um, but I would say that if you were to go back in time a thousand years and find a beer, you would probably be most likely to find something along the lines of a brown ale uh, or a maybe a Belgian dark strong beer. It would probably have a little bit of smoke to it uh, because most malt was uh, dried or kilned over a fire. And so the smoke would inherently give some character to that malt, but not necessarily. There were also pale maltings done. Uh, the Germans had a thing called wind malt. Uh, that would, they would basically just set the malt on the ground and let, let the wind and the climate dry it out. Uh, so it would not get any dark color that way, but that was much more rare. Um, I hope that helps McKenna. And then Zach asked any sort of finding agents used back then. And what Zach is talking about there, finding agents are something that we would add to a beer to help improve the clarity. It tends to be something that's gonna bind with the proteins in the beer and then drop out of the solution. So that what we're left with is a much more clear beer. Uh, I don't know exactly when they started, but there were definitely finding agents that were around in the 18th century and 19th century for sure. Eisenglass, which is one of the more traditional ones, uh, is a ground up dried fish swim bladder, traditionally made from sturgeon fish. And that was absolutely around by the 18th century um, or 19th century for sure. Um, so when they started making Pilsner, they would have had those tools available to them as brewers if they wanted to use them. But just to be clear, you can also, no pun intended, I'm clear, uh, you can also brew a very clear beer without finding agents too. Uh, most yeasts tend to want to make a clear beer and they tend to flocculate out pretty nicely, especially the yeast that we're brewing with these days. So I hope that helps Zach. Anything you wanna to add to either of those, Adam? Yeah, uh, I, I think as far as old styles, I think um, uh, according to the BJCP, um, as far as any, any time period that they'll actually reference for a style, right? Cause it, it's exactly what you're saying. How far back can you go and really say, okay, this style comes from a beer that was made in this time period definitively. Uh, and I believe for, for, uh, a, a German Bach, I believe that that originates going back to the 14th century, um, which at that time, as you said, definitely would have, um, had some smoke in it because smokeless malting hadn't even been invented until 300 years later. Um, but I, that one stands out. There might, there might be others, um, but that one stands out as being pretty old. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And, and that's a beer that has, you know, those same flavors as like, you know, similar to a Porter in the maltiness, similar to a Belgian dark strong and, you know, the maltiness yeah. and that big dark malt, uh, dark fruit character. So yeah. Awesome. All right. Let's get into these two beers. We've taken a sip, but we haven't really dived in. We can't, we can't leave the people at home wanting. Um, so let's start out with the Alpen Flow. Like I said, we'll start with our Hellas. Oh, sorry, grabbed the wrong glass. Uh, we'll start with the Hellas. And this is not exactly the ideal glassware to go through that four-step uh, sensory process that we talked about in the uh, Hazy IPA video, if you guys tuned in a couple weeks ago for that one. But just as a brief reminder, what we like to do at Six Point, especially when we're doing concentrated sensory work, is to start swirling the beer. Uh, that flips that switch in your head and you go into a work mode. Take your quick drive-by sniff or your vapor trail sniff. Think about the beer for a second. Keep swirling it. Go back for a one second sniff. Keep swirling it. Go back for a two second sniff. Cover it up and swirl it around, which is gonna be much harder with this giant mug, but not impossible. Swirl it around for about five seconds. This is concentrating some of those esters, fruity aromas maybe, 
underneath your hand. As soon as you uncover it, you want to smell that for about two seconds again. And then go ahead and take a sip. And as you take a sip, let it wash all around your mouth. Make sure it hits the sides of your cheek, the roof of your mouth, all parts of your tongue. Think about the bitterness in particular as, it swall as you swallow the beer. Does that bitterness build up or does it linger? Sometimes bitterness can build for several minutes even. So it's important to not just smell a beer once, take a quick sip, and then make your final judgment on that beer. You really have to let it develop both in your mouth and in your mind. Does that make sense, Adam? Any, anything, anything to add to the process? I know you go through this with me. Uh, for those of you guys that are at home, Adam and I sit down typically once a week when we're, I'm not traveling, when he's not traveling uh, for sensory meetings in Brooklyn at the brewery uh, for our innovation meetings. We're, we're in meetings a lot together face to face. So. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that I would add is just uh, it, it obviously totally depends on the style and, and also, uh, you know, depends on the, the person tasting um, and ultimately what your goals are in trying to evaluate the beer. But I think something that's really important is, mimicking uh, taking a sip in the way that you normally would um because sometimes and i catch myself doing this because i'm so focused on trying to taste the beer i i'm like sniffing carefully and then i take a really tiny sip but it doesn't actually really coat my palate fully um so making sure i'm taking a full sip the way that uh that i would you know drinking drinking a hellas lager like this now again there, there are different situations where you're you are tasting beer in, in smaller quantities, obviously, but making sure that you replicate that sensory experience, I think is really important. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point. So when we're talking about the Alpenflow, uh, you guys have tasting notes at home, please chime in in the chat too. If you smell a certain aroma or if you smell something you can't quite name, uh, try and spell it out over there. We'll see if we can help with it. Um, there, there's no definitives on this though. Just because something smells floral to me doesn't mean it's going to smell floral to everyone at home. But Floral is a good one for Alpen Flow. I think this has a really nice low floral note, just a little bit herbal. But front and center here, it's all about the hop. Uh, sorry, all about the malt. Has a crackery, bready, like a white bread sweetness to it. Um, something, you know, the, the smell of Wonder Bread almost. Yeah, really nice. I, I was going to say, yeah, white bread. Uh, flavor. I mean, it's just, if you close your eyes and, and drink thinking of white bread, it's like, you know, unmistakable, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and not just, you know, not just like a wonder bread either. Like there's a little bit of like a Italian white bread or a French white bread in there. Uh, something a little bit more complex, that crackery note. It, you know, all these aromas are a little bit sweet. Um, they imply a certain sweetness to them, but this is a beer that finishes very dry. Uh, Adam, do you want to talk about the recipe at all and how, how we get that dry finish and, you know, what we're looking for here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so both of these beers actually uh, feature German Pilsner malt, which um, is, is kind of annoying because malt can be called Pilsner and also a beer, um, but both ultimately derive from the same history of, of the city. Um, but what it is, is it's essentially the palest malt uh, that you can make the least amount of, of kilning uh, that's applied. Uh, whereas, you know, on the extreme end of the spectrum, you have a roasted barley that's kilned and then actually roasted the way you would roast a coffee bean and it's completely black. Um, so the base malt here is a German Pilsner malt. And the nice thing about a Pilsner malt, because you're kilning it so little, in addition to the standard malting process uh, where you have enzymatic conversion of, uh, of starches and, and sugars, you create a, a grain that's really highly fermentable. Um, so what that means is that if you start with your wort that's not yet fermented um, and you have all this sugar in it, because you use this malt that's highly fermentable, a higher percentage of that sugar will actually get consumed by the yeast. Um, so what that means is that what's left over uh, is a smaller amount of sugar creating a drier finish and a drier body. Um, so you actually get that in both of these beers. Now, uh, going back to what you're saying with uh, the, the historical differences of the Munich Hello style and the German Pill style um, and, and the, the, the difference pr primarily with the malt character, uh, this is what I found really interesting from the BJCP. 
Uh, they said verbatim, the Hellas has more malt flavor, but the same character as the Pils, uh, which I found at first ambiguous. How can it have more flavor, but the same character? And then I thought that that's actually a really great way to describe it because um, the, the character in some ways would be, uh, you know, the, the type of uh, flavor that you, that you get from it, but not so much uh, the strength. Um, so this is exactly what is happening with crisp and Alpenflow, where we're using the exact same base German Pilsner malt. So you're creating the same type of malt flavor, but in the Hellas, it's just a little more pronounced. And that's um, equal parts, uh, you know, the strength of the beer. Crisp is 5.4%, Alpenflow is 4.9%. So already you have to add more malt just to get to a certain alcohol level, uh, in addition to uh, the, the amount of hops that you're using and the bitterness. And by decreasing hop flavor and hop bitterness uh, relative to the malt character, you let it shine more, even though we're not really bumping it up all that much. Um, so uh, a, a bit of a roundabout way of, of getting there, but the, the German Pilsner malt is, is kind of the showcase of, of both of these beers. Yeah, uh, fantastic answer. Uh, I told you guys at home that Adam knows a thing or two about beer. Um, <laughs> I do, I really, and you, you said all of this, I'm just going to say it in a slightly different way. I always like to think of the difference between the two of these and the malt character as really just like turning up an intensity dial when we're talking about the Hellas. Uh, all of the malt notes that I listed, you know, all of those white breads, the crackery notes, those are all going to be in both of those beers. But in the Pilsner, they're a little bit outshone by the more pronounced hopping. Whereas in the Hellas, that hopping isn't there in such a sort of levels. So the intensity of the malts gets to really boost up and show through. Uh, that moves us into talking about hops a little bit. So by counterpoint, let's pick up our Pilsner, swirl that around, go through the same four steps. Swirl. <laughs> this one's a little bit less dangerous for me in terms of the glassware with the swirl. Yeah, I'm uh, not really in swirling territory quite yet because it's, it's quite full. For sure. I have to take a sip and then swirl. And as soon as, I mean, as soon as I do that drive-by sniff, the first thing that hits is those hops on the crisp. These are earthy hops, they're herbal hops, they're floral. I get a lot of a geranium flower note. It's a little bit spicy and almost just a hint of a citrus zest. And then you take a sip and those hops are still forefront, but they're really working with that, um, that backboard of really nice malt profile. And then that bitterness shows up on the finish and it just lingers and it builds with the crisp. It's not, a super bitter beer. We're only talking about 44 IBUs here, but coming from the Alpenflow, which is half of that, uh, it, it shines as a more bitter beer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the bitterness is, um, yeah, compared to a Hellas lager, definitely pronounced. Compared to, say, American adjunct lager, especially pronounced. But then if you go back to it, to what you were describing, a Czech Pilsner, you know, the oldest of this family, very much back in that territory. Um, absolutely appropriate bitterness in it. And I think it's really important to note because if you drink this thinking about the bitterness and then you go and you drink uh, an, an American pale ale, which will likely be a good bit hoppier, it, 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 it compares, you know, it's not completely off in, in another universe. Um, there is real bitterness here. And this idea that, uh, you know, heavy usage of hops is a more recent phenomenon um, with IPAs becoming popular and hazy IPAs, it's obviously not true at all. Um, and that's, manifest both in you know the original india pale ale and english pale ales and, and english uh, bitters but uh, also in the german pills i mean german brewers 150 years ago were absolutely using significant amounts of hops um, in their beers absolutely yeah and you know these hops um we, we've sort of alluded to this but the hops and the bitterness really uh make a difference in sort of the overall impression the beers give you. The, the Hellas is not a sweet beer, but it doesn't come off as, as like snappy and crisp, not to name drop the crisp. Um, but all Pilsners tend to be a little bit more crisp than the Hellas lagers. And, you know, th this, 
right here, the original Crispy Boy uh, and living up to the name. So since we started talking about hops, Adam, why don't you jump right into some differences in the hopping uh, build between those two, any hopping technique differences, and then talk a little bit about the uh, farm relationships that we like to have at Six Point and going over to Germany for hop harvest. Cause I'm yeah. jealous of that trip. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, they're, both of these beers predominantly feature uh, different noble hops. Um, noble hops just means uh, four different, there are four varieties that are considered the noble varieties. Um, one of them is Czech and three of them are German. And in this case, we have Alpenflow featuring the Tetnang hop, uh, which is one of the four nobles, and then the Crisp featuring um, the Hallertau hop. Um, now, what is, uh, annoying uh, about those names, but really cool is that because they're noble, it's, um, it, it's, it's based around the location. Um, so if you think of nobility, uh, you know, is that you're a name and then you're from a town or you're from a place. Um, it's a title and then a location. So with these hops, Hallertau is a region, Tetnang is a region in Germany. So the Tetnang hop, it, there are plenty of hop farms in Germany that grow all kinds of different hops, but the Tetnang hops uh, from the Tetnang region are the noble ones. And uh, that is the singular featured hop in, in Alpenflow. Um, and we get those from, uh, from one farmer uh, who, who's a family, it's a family farm. It's been in his family for a very long time um, in the Tetnang region. And then in the Hallertau region, we get uh, the Hallertau hop, um, which uh, has kind of spread into different Hallertau varieties, different offshoots, which we also use, but the Hallertau hop we get from a uh, family farm consortium, essentially. Um, so what's different about hop farms in Germany is that they're predominantly very small. Uh, they've been in families for generations and uh, some of them don't even pick their own hops. Um, so what they do is that they, uh, basically work through uh, a merchant who has worked similarly with these family farms for uh, decades or even centuries. And from there, they can go and, and sell to brewers. Um, in the US, we have hop farms that are 10 times, maybe even 100 times that size. And it's very easy to go direct to that farm and say, hey, you know, we'd like to buy some of your hops. Um, so, so that's pretty cool. But the, the key difference here, um, they're all noble hops, so same flavor profile, herbal, grassy, earthy. Um, I would say for me, when I taste these beers, uh, when I taste Alpenflow, it's predominantly more on the grassy uh, uh, aroma. And when I taste uh, the crisp, it's leaning a little more towards herbal, potentially even like a touch of mint or lavender. Um, and that's a key difference. And then uh, in particular, Alpenflow is, it, it gets just tetanine when you boil the beer. Um, all hot side additions, the crisp is actually dry hopped. Um, so in addition to getting uh, a good number of hops during the boil, after the, after the beer is uh, done fermenting and it's cold, we then add a whole bunch more hops. Um, and that's where you get uh, really intense aromatics in this way to, to match with the bitterness. Yeah, that's perfect. I saw a question in the chat as you were talking. Uh, James was asking if we source our Tetanang from the Tetanang region itself, which I think you mentioned, but just to reiterate, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yep. Uh, do you want to show a couple pictures from your last trip over there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's see, open this up. Yeah. So, okay. So this is, uh, the Bamberger Maltzerei, uh, Bamberger, uh, Maltzer. Um, and that just means they're literally the Maltzer in the, in the city of Bamberg. Um, and, this is where we get the, the malt, uh, uh, the, the, the German Pilsner malt. And uh, just to be clear, before we go on to the hops, um, we, we have always sourced German Pilsner malt for these beers um, from the very beginning. Um, we now uh, get it specifically from the Bamberg Maltster um, alongside uh, our friends at Victory. So they also uh, procure Bamberg malt. And what's so cool about this, uh, this facility is that they supply the local region um, and actually a lot of the breweries in Germany, including some of the biggest names in Munich. So when you go to Germany and you have a German Pilsner there, uh, there's a good chance that they're using the exact same Pilsner malt that we are for both of these beers. Um, 
This next one is just from inside the facility. You can see this is a massive uh, row where the grain is uh, in the germination process. Uh, if you want to learn more about malting, um, we could go into that some other time. We won't do that right now. Um, but those are that that's barley in the process of germinating. It thinks it wants to grow into a plant, um, and that helps make it more fermentable. Um, so here is uh, one of the farms in Germany. Um, and what you can see are these vines that grow really tall in Germany. For whatever reason, they grow even taller uh, than they do in the US. They grow the vines higher um, and they get picked on these machines that can pick off the cones, which are really more like flowers. They kind of look like these dense uh, little objects, but they're actually extremely light and delicate um, and they get dried. And this is actually one of those farms um, that we work with. Uh, this is in the Hallertau region. And that guy right there, um, he is the son of the father who owns the farm and it's a farm and brewery. And he's also the brewer. He's the only brewer and he's also the only kiln operator. And when it's harvest season, they stop brewing and he goes and he dries hops. Um, and that's it. That's the whole operation. Uh, so this is Bentola Farms, which is where uh, our friends at Victory also get a number of, of their hops from as well. Um, and they're again, super tiny. We can't even buy hops directly from them because they don't, their brewer and kiln dryer is one person. They don't have a, a, an accountant or an operations person uh, that just doesn't exist. Uh, and then this here is, uh, the, the farm in Tetanang. It's called Hopfengut, which literally means good hops, uh, in English. Uh, and that person on the left there is Lucas, Lucas Loker. And, um, again, he, he's, uh, he just inherited the farm from his father. Um, they're in the Tetanang region. We get all of our Tetanang hops from him. Um, and uh, on, on the right there is actually Eric Bockley, our former brewmaster. And this is there on site to go and look at our Tetanang and select. Um, so what we can do is we can uh, take a look at all of the different lots, all the different acres of hops that they have and rub them and smell them and decide which ones we want to use for us. So not only are we getting the Tetanang hops, from Tetanang, but then we get it from a specific part of the farm that we that we like best. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that's kind of the the overview of, of the procurement um, process. But uh, what it means is that for both of these beers, 100% of the ingredients are shipped over from Germany. Uh, we are not making German style beers with American ingredients and trying to recreate it. Um, we are trying to do our absolute best to try to create it as though we were brewing this beer in Germany. That perfectly said. I do have one question that came up from me uh, while you were showing the pictures. So I've been out to the Pacific Northwest uh, in America, Idaho, Oregon, Washington a couple of times now for hop harvest out there. Yeah. I haven't been over to Germany myself. I know in America, most of the hop growers grow their hops about 18 to 20 feet tall. How much taller than that are we talking about in Germany? I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I remember immediately when walking through noticing that they were taller and uh, I want to say it's uh, eight meters, which is 25 feet. Yeah, like 25 feet, maybe a little more. Um, yeah. So, yeah, okay. it's definitely a little bit taller. And yeah, I'm not really sure what, why that is. But uh, and, and that, again, that's not universal. I, I think some a couple of farms that we visited were shorter as well. Uh, but the, the, it's the way they set up their, their trellis, I suppose. Um, and I'll actually show a quick video of what the operation looks like. It looks a little bit like, um, like Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, except for hops. Um, While you're showing this video, I'm going to see if I can find any last question in the, in the chat to answer before we call it a day. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, they pick off. They're, again, they're like little flowers. They're super light. Um, I'll play that one more time. And so... Uh, because they're so much lighter than the rest of the plant, they use uh, these vertical conveyors where the plant essentially falls back and the, the hop cones stay on there. Um, yeah. Okay, so Andre has asked, uh, no irrigation in Germany. That's a question you're gonna have to answer, Adam, because I know in the Pacific Northwest, irrigation is king. You could not grow hops in Idaho or Oregon or the parts of Washington where they grow them without irrigation. That's correct. They are highly dependent on the gods. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, yields are, are definitely a little more variable for that reason. Um, part of it, though, is that uh, it's naturally a, 
a climate that's just ever so slightly more friendly. So uh, the hop plant humulus lupulus, uh, as you know, is native to Europe, not to the United States. There is a, uh, a strain that's native to the Americas as a whole, neo-Mexicanus. Um, but bringing these plants over from Europe to grow primarily predominantly in the Northwest, while the uh, the latitude is about even with Germany, so the, the sunlight is perfect for the hops. Um, the actual uh, environment for rainfall isn't quite as perfect as, as it is in Germany or the Czech Republic. Um, so the irrigation is also more necessary. Um, that's not to say that uh, it wouldn't have a benefit in Germany, but it's definitely not 100% uh, a requirement. But now what you have is uh, because of the need for it, it's actually more consistent with yields in, in, in the Northwest. Uh, these days. All right, uh, we've got two more questions I want to get to. James is asking, uh, he says basically that he knew that malts were kilned, but he didn't know that hops were kilned. Does that do anything to diminish all that diminished uh, delicious lupulin, which is basically the, uh, the juicy resin powdery. It, it looks like a yellow wax almost if you ever break open a hop cone. Uh, super sticky. It's the, the most aromatic and you know delicious part of the hops we want yeah. um I'll, I'll shoot an answer off on that one and then we'll see if you want to add anything because i know we've both yeah. spent some time with hop kilns um james the answer is that in a perfect world the kilning does not diminish the lupulin of the hops and doesn't diminish those aromatic uh, benefits that we really want i would even go so far as to say that sometimes the hop kilning changes them in a positive way. There are certain hop varieties that I can think of in particular, uh, Sabro comes to mind, you know, which is sort of a sexy, new, cool IPA hop. Um, if you ever smell Sabro in the field, it has a distinctly vegetal tomato leaf, carrot, uh, sometimes even a little bit of a diesel note uh, to it. it. Smells totally different once it's killed and dried and then even pelletized. Uh, the hop farmers have to kill the hops though. They don't really have a choice. We have to drop the moisture content to a level where they're safe. Because just like bales of hay, uh, if, if we were to bale up all these hops at very high moisture content, they'll actually spontaneously combust because of the oils in the hops. So the kilning of the hops, they wanna do it at a lower temperature. Um, that's one thing that they do to preserve those aromatics is as low of a temperature as they can, uh, their constant airflow through the hops, they're laid out in beds that are about, typically you see you know a foot to, two feet deep if they're really in the middle harvest and pulling a ton of hops off, but they want shallow beds with a lot of airflow through them. And the goal is to kill the hops at a low temperature to preserve those aromatics. You want to add to that anything, Adam? No, yeah. I mean, all I'll say is that for a real world context, uh, the one scenario where you'll find beer with non kiln hops uh, would be unkilled hops, excuse me, would be uh, wet hop beers, which is it's picked right off the vine and goes right in the beer and you skip that whole process. Um, and the reason why you can't do that more often is because hops are harvested at one time in the year and brewers make beer year round. Um, and uh, I think that that's something that um, is very uh, unique about the beer industry, especially when you compare it to say wine or, or many other industries where it's now become normalize that you should be able to get the exact same beer any time of year. But realistically, uh, malt harvests um, are only twice a year and hops once a year. And that supply has to last all the way until the next harvest. And it actually changes as it sits in storage. And then the next crop will be different, uh, much like uh, uh, grapes will vary from year to year. Um, but ultimately, we're going to still make the crisp uh, 12 months a year and that's not going to change. So we have to, we have to have them kill the hops and then we can store them and use them uh, properly. Totally. Uh, we have, obviously we have some friends over at Victory Beer who are watching along today. They ask if we think that hop harvest will look uh, a bit different this year. Uh, I'm going to say, I hope that by hop harvest, uh, we are all back to a little bit more of a normal world uh, where we're not, I will miss doing these uh, Facebook live chats every week, but uh, and maybe we can even keep them going, but I hope it's not as as much of a necessity for human interaction. Uh, I think hop harvest probably will look a little bit different. I don't know if people are going to be traveling back to normal by September, um, but I really hope they are because going out to hop harvest is one of my favorite trips of the year. Uh, I think, you know, and everyone at Six Point, we really think that 
relationships with our hop farmers are super important and developing those personal relationships and working with the farmers and, you know, doing our hop selection hands on and um, just building that camaraderie, you know, we're, we're all in this same industry. It's a super cool industry. Um, so I, I would imagine there probably will be a little bit less travel out to hop harvest this year, but we'll see. We'll see. They yeah. got to pick the hops. Yeah. Uh, and, and Oktoberfest was actually just canceled uh, in the last 24 hours. Um, so far, I think some of the smaller folks fests throughout Germany are, have not been canceled yet. Oktoberfest is obviously the, the biggest attracting millions of people, but, um, that's right around, uh, the harvest, right? It's celebrating the harvest, of course. Um, and the fact that that is canceled is definitely indicative that, uh, things are, are changing for sure. Yeah. Uh, I, sadly, I don't think we're going to be out of this, uh, super soon, but, and of course, uh, not exactly a question, but JD asked, uh, Adam, I'll let you answer this one. What is your favorite noble hop and why is it Tetnang Tetnang? Um, <laughs> uh, it sounds like a leading question. What is my favorite hop and why is it this one? You said that, I don't know. Uh, sounds like a, a real JD question. Um, so JD, here, here's my answer. It is not Tetnang Tetnang. It oh, is man. how, how or tell. Uh, and the reason why is because um, and, you, and it, this has actually uh, been proven if you look at the terpenes, um, you know, which describes the different oils and what kind of flavors they make up. Um, Hallertau is actually um, in, in, its, in one way, when you look at certain terpenes, the odd one out of the family of four, um, because it leans into that uh, menthol uh, arena a little bit, um, almost again, like I said, lavender. And I find that just so interesting and unique um and other beers obviously have that have that too but Hallertau is definitely a little more pronounced there i would say so that that's why it is not ten name ten name all right turning it around on him yeah um adam anything any closing thoughts you want to want to get to before we wrap this up uh i i don't think so i mean i i just yeah i just want to say um that you know these beers uh are again some of my absolute favorite to drink um, and it's uh, really, really special that uh, a beer like the Crisp, um, our one Pilsner is the same one that we've been making for almost a decade now. Um, and I just hope that uh, for anyone out there who wants it is able to get it, um, you should be able to. Um, we brew it regularly with all German Pilsner malt and all German hops, uh, but it's just, it's really cool to be able to drink this same beer after all these years. What about you? Any final thoughts? Uh, no, I, I think that sums it up perfectly. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy about these two beers. I think they're both fantastic examples of their respective styles. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that we wanted to do this in this format tonight, talking about the two side by side. Um, but yeah, let's, let's do one last cheers to the people at home. And then uh, cheers, guys. Cheers. Before we wrap up, I will say that next week at 6 p.m., same day, uh, Thursday at 6 p.m., Chef Drew, who's our executive chef, is going to be hosting. He's going to talk about cooking with beer, cooking and pairing uh, with beers from Victory and Southern Tier, and that should be really exciting. Drew's a fantastic chef. Uh, he, he comes up with really cool and innovative dishes, incorporating beer all the time. I like learning from him, uh, and I'm sure it'll be fun for everyone. I know I'm excited to tune in. With that, thank you guys for tuning in again this week. Uh, we really appreciate it. We miss hanging out with you guys in person. And cheers. Cheers.